Many actually punch their spouses or injure themselves. Others, like Donald Dorf, just go out for the winning pass. One night I dreamt that I was playing football as the right halfback, and the play called for me to receive the ball laterally and make a cut and go over tackle. Um, there was a 260-pound tackle there waiting for me, so I says, I'll give him my shoulder and run around him. And I went to give him my shoulder, and that's when I hit the dresser and knocked everything off and broke the mirror and cut my head and woke up, of course. Ah, Mr. Dorff, so good to see you again. Fortunately, researchers here at the Minnesota Regional Sleep Disorders Center have found that this strange condition can be effectively treated with medication. So the medication is still working pretty well. No one knows the exact cause, but scientists suspect it's neurological and related to aging. The sad thing is, since this disorder is so little known, it often goes misdiagnosed as a serious psychiatric illness. What is the brain doing while it's sleeping and dreaming? No one knows for sure, but there are many theories. Some scientists compare it to a computer that goes offline at night, closed to external inputs, but still quite busy downloading files used during the day. In 1983, Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick proposed that dreams are a kind of wastebasket for the brain. He argued that we dream to forget, to reduce fantasy and obsessive, bizarre modes of thought. Dreams are a way for the networks of the brain to avoid gridlock. And the things we dream about may be better off forgotten. In 1977, Harvard University's Alan Hobson and Robert McCarley developed their theory of the dream generator. According to their hypothesis, the raw material of dreams comes from the random firing of neurons in a primitive part of the brain called the pons. These electrical signals travel up into the cortex. The cortex then attempts to construct a story to impose meaning on these chaotic impulses. It's as if the neurons firing provide a series of random dots, and the cortex tries to connect those dots into a coherent picture. Hobson thinks that's often a hopeless task. The brain is always trying to impose meaning on whatever signal it gets, whether it comes from the outside world in waking or whether it comes from inside our heads during sleep. I mean, that's the job of the brain. It's a, the repository and creator of, of, of all meaning. And so when we're asleep and our brain turns on and we start receiving these goofy signals from inside our head, we think we're awake and we make up a story to go with it. By discounting the meaning of dreams, Hobson has aroused criticism from a generation of dream interpreters. While he doubts that dreams hold important meaning, he nevertheless markets a device he calls the nightcap that people can use at home to collect their dreams. The device detects eye movements and can be attached to an alarm clock. While Hobson enjoys tracking his own dreams, their chaotic raw material and bizarre shifts of scene lead him to doubt the validity of most dream interpretation. Well, I think it's a fool's errand, really. I mean, although I indulge in it myself, um, I have to admit that I don't really know what I'm doing when I set out to interpret a dream. And, and it, it seems to me that this is a kind of a very understandable human uh, uh, quality to want to understand the things, but maybe they don't have uh, any, any profound meaning. Uh, it's hard to imagine why we forget them if they're so all-fired important. Fool's errand or deadly serious, William DeMent has personal reason to believe in the meaning of dreams. Years ago, I was a very, very heavy smoker, and I had this incredibly vivid dream. I had a cough, and one day I was coughing, and in the handkerchief there was some blood. Well, I had a chest x-ray. My friend, the radiologist, put the x-rays up on the viewing screen. I saw the cancer, and in that moment, I knew my life 
would soon end. And it was just overwhelming. I wouldn't see my children grow up, wouldn't see green grass. It was just tremendously powerful. And then I woke up and, oh man, I can still remember it. The relief was so real. Ah, a second chance was to be reborn, but the main thing was I had experienced cancer of the lung, and I knew that was a totally unacceptable alternative. I never smoked another cigarette. That dream saved my life. A powerful dream can affect us deeply, but is the meaning in the dream itself or in how we choose to interpret it? One sort of says, well, you bring the meaning to the dream, or is it intrinsic to the dream? Uh, one has to sort of step back from that and look at life and then recognize that in a very real sense, all of life can be looked at as meaningless. And the demand, if you will, on the person as you become a human being is to recognize that one infuses life with meaning and that's what makes it tolerable and truly human. In the same way with dreams and dreaming, we all live with a system of meaning. And what we have to learn is how do we metaphorically express that meaning system in dreams so we can understand life and ourselves better. I had a dream that I was a little girl. Explore the mysteries and meanings of the unconscious mind when you order The Power of Dreams, a compelling three-part series from the Discovery Channel, now available on home video. Even children's dreams may hold up a mirror to their anxieties and help parents better understand them. Okay, guys, time to wake up. It's breakfast. Boston psychoanalyst Wynne Schwartz is the father of two boys. Since he and their mother have separated, he doesn't get to see the boys every day as he used to. He finds he learns a lot by just talking with them about their dreams. Want some syrup? They get to practice things in their dreams. And they get, I think, to work out the conflicts that they, they experience in the family. Sam has a dream about a witch chasing him in a haunted house. Well, you and me were in a haunted ha house and sitting on the sta staircase and then a witch just basically came out of nowhere and she was chasing me and she said that she was going to eat, eat me. But There is a, a witch chasing him and a father, but me, who is sitting there doing nothing. And I think that that uh, was a frightening circumstance for him. She came, she came like this close to cats and me. How'd that feel? <laughs> Pretty scary. So how did you feel when I didn't do anything, when I just sat there? I couldn't blame you because it was just, just a dream and since it was and just And he a very quickly tells me that uh, it's no one's fault, that in dreams you can't uh, blame people for not coming to your aid. So the dream in some ways must be a story about something he's feeling about what's happening here, something that uh, he really can't escape and something he can't really feel like he can get help with. Did you want me to help you, though? Well, yeah, I get. Well, I I guess. Ready? Your mark. Get set. Run. Run. The other way, Graham. This way. This way. This way. Just as adult dreams will show me, their ongoing efforts to represent the problems of their lives, children's dreams will represent their own problems. In this very large world, it's quite natural for their dreams to represent their, their vulnerability. Our dreams enable us to explore new worlds of our own creation. But at times, they also reveal our deepest fears. Our habits of dreaming may even provide a window on our personalities. Based on studies of dreamers, one researcher has developed a new theory of personality types called boundaries in the mind. Now, what I've found is that people who have a lot of dreams, people who remember dreams a lot, and especially people who have nightmares a lot, are people who have thin boundaries. 
And by thin boundaries, I mean boundaries in many, many different senses. Boundaries between different sensations, boundaries between thoughts and feelings, between sleeping and waking, between dreaming and waking, between fantasy and reality. But the opposite, uh, I've seen quite a lot of people who have very thick boundaries. They usually don't remember dreams, they don't have nightmares, and they keep everything very separate. Evan Elkington is a successful sales engineer who has enjoyed competing in sports since he was very young. He's a good example of Hartman's thick boundary profile. You just had to describe your childhood in, in a few words. Uh, you know, what, what kind of a child were you? What kind of a kid were you? Uh, yeah, I think I've uh, always been very competitive uh, and aggressive throughout my childhood, and I think that came from my older brother always pushing me. Hmm. Did you spend much time in the kind of fantasy or daydreaming, reverie? And uh, I wouldn't call it fantasizing or daydreaming. I, uh, I would say it'd be more of uh, planning. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember your dreams at all? Or? Uh, no, I can't remember the last time I had a dream, to tell you the truth. Evan is one of many people who live a happy and successful life without paying any attention to their dreams. Were you, were you artistic at all? Were you involved in painting, music? Uh, mostly uh, math and science were my best courses in school. And Hartman has found that thick boundary people often find occupation as lawyers, engineers, and military officers. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Far. By contrast, yeah. he finds people who are strongly influenced by their dreams tend to have thin boundaries and quite different occupations. I've gotten to know a lot of people who have very, very thin boundaries. I have fairly thin boundaries myself, but uh, the people I think of have the, the thinnest boundaries have, uh, first of all, they're, they never have typical blue color or white color jobs. They do something unusual. And, and generally, it's something artistic, creative. So that they're artists, they're painters, poets, uh, musicians, whatever. And furthermore, they often use their dreams and nightmares in their work. I've never had a morning where I didn't remember a dream. Marcia Smilak, a writer and photographer, lives on Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts. Dreaming is important to every aspect of my life. Um, it's such an integral part of the creative life, whatever that is, that I couldn't really separate it out. It is the same thing. It's the same images. But what I do, I call it painting by camera. I sit here and I, in a sense, let the water be the canvas. And I watch these different pictures get painted by the movement of the water and the tide and the light and all that. And when I see a picture that I like, the camera is my paintbrush, and I take it. Marcia creates abstract, dreamlike images with her photography, and she draws on images from her dreams in her writing as well. But her sensitivity and thin boundaries may at times make her vulnerable to depression. So, so you're, you're a finder of beauty, and, and I... I guess you, you always have been. Yeah. I think also a finder of, of sadness, yeah. which doesn't seem so contradictory to me. Yeah, can you give me some idea of what, what your dreams are like? Can you say, um, tell me a recent dream? Sure. This was a dream actually I had about 10 years ago, but I, I, I never forgot it. And in, this, in, in real life, I was in the process of ending a, a long relationship, and I was, in fact, depressed. Mm -hmm. and when I went to sleep, I had a dream that this boyfriend and I were sitting in my den. And I understood that I would die unless he stayed in the house until 6 o'clock. And luckily, he was there, and I was feeling very relieved. And suddenly, it was about 10 of 6, and he stood up, and he walked out the door. and there was this low-ramp preacher waiting for me. I remember he had on a 
gown that was too short, and you could see his pants and cowboy boots, and he was holding a can of Colt 45 beer. And I remember thinking, cheap beer. Anyway, he walked me over to where I was going to be buried, and in the middle of this cemetery was this grand piano with the lid open. And I walked around and looked inside, was this outline of my body, like police make when they find a body, only it was little yellow pills. And in the dream, that was where I was going. Marcia's dream came at a time when she was taking antidepressant medication. It was also the time when she began to take up photography. And over time, I came to think about the piano and why, why a piano? And I've decided it seems obvious to me that it's because a piano is a place where you create art, not a place where you bury people. And so the combination of the pills, which I was taking to give me some sense of structure or boundaries or control, that was one version of finding a shape that would fit. But art was ultimately what saved me and what I think could save anyone. are what we make of them. Some people may live well without ever remembering them. For others, dreams become a kind of second life. We have reason to be intrigued by our dreams. They are among the most amazing things our minds create. It's been said, dreams are real while they last. Can we say more of life? Coming up next on the Discovery Channel, experts in the field of dream research offer ways to interpret our nocturnal thoughts in The Power of Dreams. Explore your subconscious on the Discovery Channel.